Hi, um, this is Zainab Gambetti joining in from Istanbul. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers and particularly Robin um, Selikates for inviting me um, to participate in this initiative. Um, like you, I'm um, totally overwhelmed uh, with the, the speed of the contagion and the sheer size of its victims. And I'm trying to make sense um, of what's happening to us uh, right now. Um, these victims, um, we uh, sort of cite in numbers each day, um, forgetting that they are unique human beings, um, irreplaceable um, individuals with a life story, with achievements, and many loving friends and relatives um, are unfortunately um, increasing. And except for celebrities, um, I think, uh, many deaths will go publicly unnoticed, unmourned, appearing only as part of national or global um, statistics um, in this epidemic. This is one of the saddest experiences um, uh, we should think about right now, um, and um, we should do it right now even before uh, the crisis is over, because I think these are not just extraordinary experiences uh, that make us feel that we are playing um, walk on roles in some dystopic science, fic science fiction um, movie, for instance. Um, but crises like these, like the present one, uh, lead to a heightened awareness of the structural problems that otherwise go unnoticed. Uh, because these crises breach the normal functioning of, of societies. So as it spreads, the COVID-19 um, pandemic mirrors the way um, our societies are structured. Uh, it brings to light all that is wrong uh, with our societies and our mode of life. But it also urges us to pull the emergency brake, as Walter Benjamin might say, um, in order to distinguish between um, that which is absolutely crucial um, for collective life on this planet, as opposed to that which is secondary, unnecessary, avoidable, disastrous, or even fatal. Um, as we all know, COVID-19 is not a mere accident of nature. Um, human activity has played a re large role in producing um, this situation. Our production and consumption patterns, crowded existence in megalopolises, an incessant movement across the globe have um, had a devastating impact um, on the climate and on natural habitats. Our misplaced faith in technological progress, um, the neoliberal assault on the welfare state, and the violent suppression of popular movements demanding alternatives to the market um, and to market rationality. These are all causing deaths across the, uh, across the globe. This blindness must be questioned, and it must be questioned now. Um, when this pandemic is over, we cannot go back to business as usual, and we cannot go back to forgetting as usual. Um, one thing we must never forget is how we have interiorized and naturalized capitalist rationalities. Um, the pandemic brought to light how politics in contemporary societies uh, was not concerned with collective life at all, but rather with the sway of um, was under the sway of um, the the iron laws of the market. It also showed that those laws are undesirable, unsustainable, and that they are not unchangeable. A huge amount of public money, as you know, has appeared out of nowhere in Europe and the US. Um, and all the elaborate arguments crafted to justify neoliberal austerity um, policies like, oh, the state has no money for retirement pensions, or uh, the state will have to reduce the budgetary allocation to health and social security, blah, 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 have vanished under the magic wand. Um, uh, which is actually the struggle for life and death. Um, now, we know that Margaret Thatcher's infamous slogan, there's no alternative, Tina, uh, is a total mystification. 
there is always an alternative, as long as there is willpower and the capacity for collective action. Uh, we must also never forget that food, accommodation, and health are the most precious goods for all of us, irrespective of geographical location, culture, ethnicity, class, or status. Uh, having to scale down our needs and expectations so as to um, adapt to self-isolation conditions, we slowly uh, but surely come to realize that we can live without most of the consumer goods that we surround ourselves with in order to, to what? To give ourselves a false sense of fulfillment and, and security. Our capitalist societies produce desires whose satisfaction is imperatively mediated by the market. We are made to feel insecure without mass consumables, supermarkets, processed food, the newest gadget or um, high-tech equipment. The pandemic, uh, on the other hand, has driven the message that less consumption is not only possible, that it is possible, but that it is utterly beneficial for the planet's air, water, and natural resources. Uh, okay, so this having been said, the main question I want to address here um, has actually to do with whether or not the, the virus is egalitarian. And I shall claim that it is not. Uh, and I want to attract your attention on how the virus has generated a new um, marker of status in our societies. Uh, that marker of status uh, is the power to self-isolate. That's the new marker of class, actually. Um, the lesson that this crisis teaches us is that confinement is a protection strategy only for those who can afford to stay at home or for those whose work is not essential for collective life. Only a third of salaried employees can actually afford to self-isolate, waiting for the virus curve um, to get lower, without wondering too much about who produces and maintains the electricity, the water, the gas, the internet cables, um, the transportation system, the supermarkets, the fields and facilities where our food is produced, um, the computers we use, the medicine we take, the news we are reading or watching, and all other products and services that, makes, um, that make our lives livable. Uh, while we sit safely at home, others uh, will have to go out and confront the virus in order to feed us, cure us, provide us with vital public services. Or they will have to go out and confront the virus because sick leave is not guaranteed, or because they are self-employed, or because they have precarious sources of income no job security, not enough savings, too much debt, and so on. Or, last but not least, they will have to confront the virus because they are already confined. They are already confined in excessively cramped conditions as in the Moria um, refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece. Uh, the refugees um, in such camps um, uh, are confined and yet, they are extremely exposed to the virus, since uh, there is no chance for them to keep a social distance uh, or self-isolate. Uh, the Moria camp, for those of you who don't know, um, has a capacity of 3,000, but now accommodates 20,000 refugees. Uh, so, um, when we're addressing uh, the public, requesting that we should all stay at home. Who is this we that we are addressing? Uh, right, we should think about that. Who is this we um, who can actually afford to stay at home? Uh, the point here is not, um, let's not, um, let's avoid a misunderstanding. The point here is not to contest the utility of confinement as a preventive strategy that slows down the spread of COVID-19. That's granted. But to admit that the inequalities and contradictions inherent in even the most democratic and developed countries are being made invisible by the dominant narratives that are being circulated um, on the topic of confinement right now. Social control and confinement practices are never neutral. 
They are power practices. Their deployment for the sake of public health in the present case should um, not cause us to neglect um, asking questions. The dispositives in the hands of governments are not deployed in an egalitarian manner. The imaginaries and practices that are related to um, biological crisis, biopolitical um, crisis management in our day and age render invisible sizable portions of the population who cannot self-isolate. Governments, the media, or even um, critical intellectuals keep presupposing that everybody has a home or a stable salary or savings in the bank. They urge the population to maintain hygiene and wash hands regularly without guaranteeing that all individuals will have access to soap and water. Um, they justify confinement without considering whether or not everyone has a home or a work-from-home type of job. They try to tackle the pandemic without admitting or um, proposing a remedy um, to the neoliberal devastation of healthcare systems. These omissions put everyone at risk. Uh, not just now, but also in the future when, they, um, when we are likely to face many other pandemics. But that's not all. Governments are disavowing their propensity to confine. Uh, when the French President Macron was announcing stricter um, isolation measures in his address um, to the nation on March 16, for instance, he theatrically um, admitted that the French will be shocked by, uh, by um, what they just heard. Um, his underlying uh, message was that France, the land of freedom, uh, was unaccustomed to totalitarian measures uh, such as confinement. But confinement would nevertheless be deployed, Macron said, since the French were presently at war. He actually repeated war um, seven times. This particular framing of the question of confinement, not only by Macron, but also by many other politicians and journalists, actually conceals that European governments are already practicing confinement not on Europeans, of course, but on refugees, treating them exactly as they are treating the virus. Or rather, when refugees are confined, it is because they are considered viruses. When Europeans are confined, it is to protect them from the virus. It's not the first time that large numbers of people are being confined in Europe. But because Europeans take it as rational and normal that Europe closes its borders to refugees and to viruses, most of them are not shocked to see refugees confined. Frontex and disinfection squads are part of the same frame for them. The situation is not any better in Turkey. Um, the government closed schools and universities, banned cultural activities, um, all sorts of meetings, of course, um, imposed a full-time curfew on people above the age of 65, and halted all intercity displacement to stop the virus from spreading. Um, despite all this, the number of infections is increasing at a daily rate that is even um, higher than in Italy. We had 2,000 new infections registered in a single day on March 27. Uh, the EKP government announced an economic relief package that reassures industrialists and financialist, uh, financial um, capitalists but that does not include paid leave for employees or universal income for precarious contractual workers. In this country, which is already experiencing an economic crisis, millions have to continue to go to work despite the pandemic. The government's slogan, there's life at home, is a euphemism that cannot save the lives of those who must feed their families or pay debts or have to work to feed the rest of society. Feed me, for instance. But there's worse. Who remembers the thousands of refugees who were encouraged by the Turkish government um, a month ago to head for Europe and who had been kept waiting in um, no man's land um, along the Greek-Turkish border because Europe did not want them? Well, um, after exposing the refugees to the virus for a month without shelter and healthcare or running water uh, in that no man's land, 
Yesterday, the government finally remembered them. Um, it announced that it was moving them to a camp near the Syrian border. Um, will these refugees even count among the COVID-19 um, statistics from Turkey when they contract the virus or die? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And this is why we must never take confinement as a natural or rational um, reaction to the pandemic but critically expose the unquestioned frames, norms, and codifications that mark some lives as worth protecting and uh, neglects other lives or confines them to exposure or to death. We must understand that nobody can be safe if invisible individuals are ignored and left to their fate. Um, to conclude, I'm not sure whether this crisis will by itself prompt a change in perspectives or operate a gestalt switch for the majority of people. Um, the narrative espoused by politicians and commentators continues to conceal the malfunctioning um, of our societies. This is not a matter of charity, of the state generously bestowing the worst off um, with a couple of bucks to keep them within the consumption loop until the rate of contagion um, goes down and we can uh, pretend to go back to business as usual. This is not about how we react temporarily and under duress to our crisis, but how we start seriously changing our lifestyle, our mode of production and our relationships with others who are not of the same class, gender, culture, geographical location and material circumstances as us. The we that I address here, of course, um, includes all those who have the relative luxury to stay at home and self-isolate.